So uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, to be introducing this event. Uh, this is um, a, a really exciting new initiative between the Tropi Bio Project here at CBL and the TBA, the Tropical Biology Association, who, as I'm sure everyone knows, are the are the most well known. Uh, provider of topical field courses and other types of training and capacity raising in conservation and ecology. Uh, and they have a focus in Africa as the Tropi Bio Project has. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, Rosie Trevallion, who's the director of the TBA, sitting in the front here, and uh, Mariana Cavallo. Uh, and what we're planning to do is we're going to do a joint Topi Bio TBA field course in Guinea-Bissau uh, at the end of this year. And uh, we're going to be training people from Lucifone Africa. So we're going to be, uh, in addition to students from Guinea-Bissau, we're going to be bringing over students from Angola, Sao Tome, uh, Cabo Verde, and Mozambique. And also we're going to uh, take uh, a, f a few students. We have three or four places for students from our own course here at CBL. So it's going to be a really mixed course and it's going to be the, the first one of its kind. So I, I'm very much hoping that this is going to be the first of, of several that we're going to be able to do. So the, the event today is, is a round table, uh, something that is, is very close certainly to all of us who work in the Topi Bio's interests, uh, which is a, a round table on, on how can we work better between uh, when we are working between the Global North and the Global South. Uh, so uh, Philippa, one of our postdocs on the Topi Bio project has organized this and is organizing the field course if you want to know more about it. So I'll just hand over to Philippa introduce the round table. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here, and also to the people who are joining us online in Zoom and uh, on YouTube as well. Um, so today we have uh, three uh, panelists with us to discuss this topic. Uh, I will uh, introduce them. So two of them are here with us, and another one will join us online. So, uh, Rosie Trevelyan, uh, I will just very, very briefly introduce them. And Rosie is the director of TBA. I think uh, many of you might already know her, because uh, I also know that some of you had already participated in these courses. Um, so Rosie is a passionate advocate of capacity building, has a vital tool for effective conservation. Rose is a British zoologist with a PhD from Oxford University, and she has been at the TBA from the beginning, creating the courses TBA runs, including Madagascar, Kenya, and Borneo, between others. Rosie makes sure, uh, sure that TBA teaching has a real and lasting impact. She has also been a leader, partner, and contributor on a variety of conservation projects around the globe, ranging from institutional capacity building through developing and testing teaching materials to integrating social issues into conservation. And our uh, other panelist is Mariana Carvalho. Uh, and Mariana is the course coordinator of TBA. Uh, Mariana is Portuguese. She's a, an applied biologist with a PhD from the University of Lisbon. She has over 15 years of field experience, much, most of those working in Africa. Mariana has also joined a TBA field course back in 2000, uh, which has deeply influenced her professional career. Mariana has conducted social ecological research in the tropical forests of Santo Tome and Príncipe, and in the Miombo woodlands of North Mozambique. She also uh, led a program of biodiversity conservation grants to civil society in West Africa. Um, sorry. 
And uh, today, Mariana's interests range uh, from bird ecology to bushmeat hunting and social determinants of species conservation, in addition to conservation science and communication uh, yeah. and capacity building. And our third uh, panelist is Mohamed Enriques. Uh, and I'm very happy he is able to join us today because uh, this uh, discussion would not make so much sense without someone from the tropics. Um, and so Mohamed, I don't know if he's around here, if you'd like to show up. Uh, Mohamed has been working on biodiversity conservation and I'll go. Uh, and monitoring uh, in Guinea-Bissau for more than 11 years. Since 2014, Mohamed has been developing research in ornithology, particularly focused on species distribution and spatial ecology in the country. During his master, Mohamed studied the distribution patterns and developed models to estimate the size of vulture populations in Guinea-Bissau. Mohamed has also been actively involved in conservation planning and awareness to, uh, work to protect vultures in West Africa. Currently, Mohamed research interests are geared toward the study of special ecology of shorebirds and intertidal ecology, on which he did his PhD uh, in the Bijagos Archipelago in Guinea-Bissau with the University of Lisbon. Thank you very much. What a, what, a great, what a great introduction. Can everybody hear me? Uh, so my job really is uh, to set the scene and uh, I'm going to tell you about the Tropical Biology Association. So in true learning fashion, instead of me kind of lecturing us about good practice, I just want to give an example of what we do, and then we can discuss uh, at the end what we can do better. So the Tropical Biology Association aim is to build a critical mass of conservationists, because although it's said that people are often the cause of the threats to the biodiversity, we just heard from Philippa, People are also the solution. And uh, we, we've already talked about the tropics, and we know that the most of biodiversity um, is in the tropics. And we also know that that's where most of the threats to biodiversity are, and arguably fewer resources. And it's certainly why uh, we are focusing on the tropics. And so at the center for what we do is really around practical training. And we do this in three main ways. We run field courses, and you've just heard the really exciting news that we're now planning a joint field course with Tropi Bureau that will happen this year. We also run specialist courses uh, to fill in the particular skills gaps. And uh, more recently, we've launched our online courses, and we've been really excited about the, the uh, real potential that online learning can, uh, can have and the outreach it can have as well. And of course, it's a great way to learn uh, while keeping your emissions really low. And our overall approach really is, I said our training is practical, but importantly, it's relevant. Importantly, training is relevant because uh, if you teach um, people uh, around things that they can relate to, people are going to learn it better. So rather than deciding back home what we should teach is how to make this teaching relevant and tailored. Our, our approach is also collaborative. So we want to do a, have a two way sharing of expertise. There are, there's expertise around the world. There's expertise in people with, with, who've gone through a lot of traditional education. There's expertise amongst people who have um, not gone through traditional education. And we really want to bring this expertise together, but see it as a way of sharing it in a two-way uh, system. And importantly, we want to have impact. We want our training to have impact. And we would like to uh, leave the world in a better place by having this critical mass of conservationists um, having conservation impact in their own countries. So to have a north-south collaboration, um, to start with, we have offices both in Africa, so we have an office in Kenya and in Europe, um, in UK where Mariana and I are. So this is, our, this is the head of our African office here is uh, Kuria, who's in the wheelchair there, um, and uh, we're based in Cambridge. So the idea there is everything we do has that African and European lens. So we want to benefit from uh, expertise from both places. So I thought I'd focus on field courses as our example of how we're um, having our impact and how we're doing our best to promote best practice. So I thought the best way to do that is we should all go on a field course together. So I'm going to take you all on a TBA field course. 
So here's where we run them at the moment. So particularly in East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, but also Madagascar. We also run courses in Southeast Asia, for example, in Borneo. I'm going to focus on Africa because I know that's where the interest is here. So obviously, first of all, we have to get there. So um, one thing you learn uh, about um, doing field courses is you need to take enough students with you who can push the bus when it gets stuck <laughs> in the mud. But it's really important that we work in partnership at the field sites we go to. So the picture on the left is in Kibali Forest. That's the Makeri University Biological Field Station. And the picture on the right is where we go in Madagascar. And the Madagascar site is run by the forest department. And what we did, we were able to do there is we were able to help build infrastructure. So we built this lecture room, which is also a meeting room. So the field station can use it as well as us. And as you can see, it's fully air conditioned. And uh, there's even a butterfly net there just in case something really interesting turns up while we're having a lecture. But it's not just about infrastructure. It's also about this uh, two way sharing of expertise. We're being hosted by the field station. And uh, so we can learn a lot from them. And uh, so we, we co-design our courses with the stations that we're at. And from almost the very beginning, one thing that we've always followed is that uh, we have a 50-50 rule. So we have half of the students come from the host region. So for example, this is a Madagascar course. So half of the students came from Africa and half from elsewhere, Europe, US, wherever. So the important thing there for us was to was to build this level playing field so that uh, we can share things um, equitably. We also open the courses up to people from all over the uh, all over the Africa and Europe. So we usually have around 20 countries on each course. So it's like a mini United Nations. And uh, I think this sharing of cultures is so important. And the best way to do that is just to bring people together and allow them to learn from each other. And it's a kind of thread that goes through all of our courses. And our te we, we're really lucky. We have world experts teaching on our courses. Um, and we're able to invite them from all over the world. People come and teach on our courses because they really believe in what we do. And importantly, at least 50% of our teachers are also from the host region. So again, really important that uh, we know that it's not, as we were hearing from Philippa, it's not true that the experts are only from the global north or only those who've, who've published from the global north. So we have a, a variety of teachers coming on our courses. And most importantly, half of them are from the host region. And um, this just brings such a rich of teaching that I think no single university could match. So we kind of like to fill the gaps that universities leave in teaching. We, and, uh, and really create a kind of our own um, mini university. And I put this slide in here because this is Dr. Marco Tieno. He's teaching on our Kenya course that we ran last year. He came on a TBA course as a student. He's now one of Kenya's leading researchers and he collaborates with Europeans as a lead PI. And here he is coming back on a course to teach. Um, so, it's not uncommon for at least half of our teachers on TBA courses to be alumni, whether they're from Europe or from, or from Africa. So we use the forest or the savannah as our outdoor classroom. Again, we don't want to replicate how we teach at university or what people have learned. So, and I'm sure you'd agree that um, learning firsthand is the best way to learn. It's the way that you remember things. It's you learning yourself. So we really encourage people to make observations, um, to ask questions, to find out what's going on. Like this student here is finding out whether these sunbirds, are they nectar robbers? Um, how much nectar is in these flowers? And so we are really encouraging people to become independent researchers themselves, to ask questions. And that, don't just ask a question, go and try and find the answer to the question. So our courses are, are very general. We use the outdoor classroom. Teachers come with from different disciplines, different areas of expertise. Um, so here, here are two learning about acoustic sampling on a, on a TBA course. So people will also learn some new techniques that they might be able to apply themselves. And we also use case studies as a way of teaching. It's such a great way of learning. Um, 
So we visit conservation projects that are in the area where, where our courses are. So um, that students can learn about real conservation on the ground. And I think this really is where um, people learn. It's really, it's kind of what we call going from textbook to reality. You can learn about conservation, you can read about it, but actually meeting, meeting people who are at the forefront and doing the conservation is so useful. And that goes for research as well. So people kind of learn firsthand really what's going on and how things work. Um, we, have a, we have a really nice uh, section on our courses, which Mariana ran uh, last year called Conservation in My Country, and where everybody had a chance to talk about conservation in their country. And so that was, you know, maybe over 20 different countries. So people can learn a lot from each other. I, and I think that uh, people probably learn as much, if not more, from each other than they do from the tutors. But don't tell the tutors that. And then, of course, people get a chance to do their own real life research. And for many people, this is the first time that they've, managed, they've been able to do their own research project. They can choose what they want to work on. They can come up with the question. And of course, it's a wonderful way to learn about other cultures because students are going to be learning from people from another hemisphere. They're going to work together on their research project. Um, and for many people, it's the first time that they've done this. I put this in an example project that was done in Borneo. So these two students were interested in, in uh, the beetles that feed on fruit and whether they differed at different levels in the canopy. And as you can see, they used really high tech equipment which is basically string and a plastic bottle. And that's what they used for their traps. And I put this in because what I thought was really great was that students learned that really good research doesn't rely on high tech equipment or having loads of money. It relies on having a really good question and thinking about how to answer it. And in this case, of course, on collaboration, people from completely different hemispheres are collaborating together on this. So I always really like to remind, remind ourselves that we don't, it's not the equipment that's necessarily needed. It's, the, it's the, uh, the passion for finding out about the natural world that's out there and learning to collaborate together. And that includes on, of course, writing up the real life research. People write the projects up on the course and actually present them. So we have a mini science seminar at the end of the course um, after where people can tell everyone what they found out in their projects. I think we've had around 40 publications from the student projects. And for many people, this is their first ever publication. And, and uh, it's not necessarily the case that they all got published in these journals. Um, the important thing here is I think people really learn and they learn about this throughout the whole course is confidence. Is it's often the case that students feel that you have to be some professor to be able to publish or do you have to have 20 years experience to do a project on beetles at the top of a at the bottom of a top of a canopy and what we're showing them is that they actually have the capability and the potential themselves to do it so we don't aim to have the projects published because everybody writes them up but some many of them have been and uh, it's their first ever paper and it's a really great way to start on that scientific career So I mentioned that we um, really aim and really care about having impact. What about our impact? This is something that Aurora said from Nigeria after her course in Uganda. For the first time in my life, I realized the things I saw in fancy science textbooks or on the Disney Channel, sorry, Discovery Channel, were happening in my backyard. Exciting research on African soil by Africans was possible. And I think that's why it's so important that we have teachers from all over the world, but it's not just people coming out from Europe to tell people. And she went back to Nigeria and she said, well, nobody, I haven't seen a Nigerian working on bats. So she started to work on bats there. And she is now not just Nigeria's expert, but one of Africans experts on bats. And, uh, and I think this is just such a lovely story of how just one month can just plant that seed. Caleb from Ghana said that the TBA field course changed my life. It inspired me to pursue a future in research and conservation. I've never looked back. Again, you can't learn everything in one month, but you can be inspired to go and do more when you go home. So Caleb has actually is responsible for setting up this nature reserve here, and it's now uh, being run by local communities. And he's 
basically been behind saving an endangered species of frog as a result. And, I, and again, our course is for African and Europeans. And uh, Jamie from UK said that it, it again shaped his career. It hastened my development as a scientist and steered me in the right direction for realizing my full potential. So we have around 1,900 field course alumni, many of whom came from Portugal, so that's really awesome. Many of whom are in this room today, so that's also really awesome, coming from around 80 countries. And we do follow up what people, where people go. So of the people we're in touch with, 95% are in conservation of one sort or another. They might be teaching, they might be researching, they might be in government. And you heard from Caleb and from uh, Irora what they were doing. And I did a little experiment. I thought, well, what, what happened to people on this course, which was in 2005, because I used it earlier on in this talk. So one of them is, head, is the head of Madagascar's leading NGO. So that's Julie in the front row. We have a professor of climate change. One of them is a coordinator of an insect biome atlas project. Another one is a senior researcher, but works in science policy and innovation. And another one is director of Karasoka Research Center in Rwanda, which is the one that looks after gorillas. So this is where, what they're all doing now. So it, it's really wonderful to hear what people do after their courses. We also have alumni groups in 15 different African countries. So these are people who went back home and said, I want to, I want to carry on what I learned and I want to hand it to other people. We want to train the next generation. So they set up their own groups and there's 15 of these groups and hopefully we'll be seeing some more in uh, Portuguese speaking West Africa after the course. We also want to know how we can meet the demand. There's a huge demand for this training. It's quite unusual. Not many people are offering it. So we have around 400 applicants each year for the 12 places we can give on our annual field course. So that's a lot, that's a huge demand. And we want to do more, which is why we're really excited to be able to run, run a new course um, with Tropi Bio. So to summar, summar, summarize, um, I wanted to kind of maybe show by example how we've been trying to uh, promote good practice that uh, Filippo asked us to do. And I'm just going to use, use this one picture to sum it up for me, which is we have people from different countries and they're all working together to work out how to do a particular research project that was looking at herbivory levels on acacias in, uh, in Kenya. And behind them is an African teacher just watching over them, but they're working it out for themselves. And there was quite a bit of argument, but they solved it in the end. And, they, and, and that was, I think, was the essence of the kind of teaching we want to do. The other thing I wanted to remind us all is that it's not about us. It's about the learners. And I think this cartoon summarizes it really well. I'm not, I'm not sure if they understood the lesson, but I taught it really well. And that's what we don't want to do. It's not about us. It's what do people on our courses want to learn? And that's what we should really, really focus on. And if we do that, I think we'll make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosie. It was, sorry, yeah, questions at the end. Thank you. So that was really inspiring talk. Um, I will now invite uh, Mariana. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariana Cavall, and uh, Philippe already presented myself. Uh, I think I'm really excited to be here. Also a bit nervous because I come in kind of a, um, with a difficult uh, task of sharing something I'm not an expert to of and I have been learning about. So Rosie did an excellent uh, framing of how TBA is doing uh, the best um, possible in, in trying to instigate best practices to actually uh, reduce these uh, gaps and inequity that uh, we know that exists between the global north and the global south. And um, just a bracket on that, there aren't, it's difficult to find the right terms for this conversation, so I'm going to um, stick to those, global north and global south, although obviously they can be discussed. Um, so I'm not an expert. I have an, a journey that brought me uh, to different places and saw uh, different uh, perspectives around these uh, inequities and sort of in working in the tropics uh, uh, most of my life. 
So I've been an academic uh, for uh, a while. I've done research. I started in, in Saint Tome, but also worked with communities, NGOs, and um, with a donor uh, also for the last five, uh, six years before joining TVA. So having a bit of different perspectives of how this, this uh, situation also uh, comes up in other worlds and more practical conservation worlds, but also uh, with research. Um, so, uh, just on the pitfalls of parachute science, and I think this is probably a better term than um, decolonizing conservation, which is, um, again, a difficult one. Uh, so, we are aware, and as Rosie said, at the high biodiversity levels, and uh, also the imminent threats are typically in Global South, uh, and that attracts a lot of attention, and um, obviously the funding is less there, there's a lot of funding, there's philanthropes, uh, NGOs, academia, uh, there's a huge interest of working in the tropics. Um, and, but it, again, is often channeled um, by the North. And there's always, I think, the intention is always very good. It's always the best one. We want to do the best for conservation. We want to do the best for these countries and for the science in general. Uh, it's not the but it's not always uh, our acts do not always match uh, what their reality is. And uh, there are huge power disparities uh, that results from historical legacies and uh, differential wealth results, but also educational access to information, to knowledge, to skills. And uh, that brings um, the level filter is not even. So uh, we are coming from different places in the first place. So um, collaborating on the ground is also not uh, an even play field. And um, that goes from project inception and where we, when we think about what projects could we bring, but also to the gathering, data gathering and the application even after the results and the conservation strategies. So my own um, personal journey, and I'm, that's when I'm, when I'm trying to share, and that was my experience. So I started as a researcher wanting to go to the tropics. Actually, I started in a TBA course. That was uh, my uh, determinant to, for what I wanted to, to do and, and the immersion in the tropics and sort of the understanding and the feeling of such complex systems, but also the culture. And uh, Rosie mentioned the cultural diversity that we have uh, in the courses. And it's, it's, it's amazing. And these things are not um, separate and not possible to separate from each other. Um, but then after the course, I uh, managed to get a grant and go and do my PhD. Um, well, actually to do my research, um, in first research in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau. And obviously things are directed or are channeled through the Northern countries. The funding came from um, Portuguese, the FCT, uh, and that we all know for sure and um and that brings the determinants that drives how research is done in in many cases uh, so although i think we do our best to do to be collaborative and to to understand the drivers and to understand the needs we often don't have the chance so um we have research um funding it's limited no time for pilots uh, go in the field do your collect your data and come back and obviously this has loads of consequences in um in in many aspects but this is the scenario that often at, uh, researchers we face so we do have to find a local partner we have to have uh, access to research permits and to have collaborations but that collaboration is not even and it's not done uh, in a way that um, actually brings uh, the best of both sides Sorry, I, I had to go through my notes. <laughs> so this is typically the pitfalls of parachute science and uh, the type of science that would go and sort of land with the money and the resources in somewhere uh, with a high biodiversity interest. And uh, that will bring out the data and um, this academic success uh, associated to that. Um, and obviously I, I do, realize that this is not uh, this is not ideal and this is not the way um, that ideally we would like to share knowledge and to have collaborations going so uh, what kind of 
barriers we have. So I think one of the things is on our side, uh, and again, this is about the lens that I'm uh, that I see. So my position, but the Western um, centric approach of science. So uh, there is there is a. a a consensus or kind of there is an agreement that the Western or the Global North knows how to do science and knows how to do it better uh, and this is kind of how we do it and uh, so we're trying to get the equivalent from from the other end and that's not always uh, true uh, so I think that is um, probably a big barrier or that is a big barrier and it's a big barrier because we are we are we are creating the language not just a language in terms of english or in terms of portuguese or how we communicate but we are creating also the work language and that goes with with a, a structural barrier for uh, situations where people don't really have access to the same background as we do so how fair it is to actually dominate that language and and how much does it help basically because we are missing a lot in um, the context or other languages that we are not uh, actually looking at um so also it's it's been and I'm, i think this, this is all kind of this all this presentation is around looking for change so i think uh, a lot looking at what mistakes we've been doing or how it's been um conducted and how can we go forward uh, but i think a pluralistic approach has been lacking uh, we also focus too much on biodiversity we go we just collect the data uh, and come back and there is sometimes ignoring or neglecting the social and the cultural contexts of the place where we do research. And these are key. So we are missing information. We are missing context. We are missing a lot with that. Um, again, goes hand in hand with unequal power balances and uh, language in here, real language is an issue, uh, but also differing priorities and research cultures. Um, so I think uh, there's also a general overconfidence uh, on the side that holds the, the financial resources that goes with, with what was said about the language and creating the, the, the structure. Uh, but that is also sometimes fed with local governments and institutions complying to, to that power structure and help maintain that. So it, it's, it's, I've lived in, the, in, in countries where universities or um, or the local structures would be interested to have uh, the support from from the outside probably more than looking at the structures they have internally and that perpetuates the system when we keep on looking at uh, the north as having the key uh, and the power and um, keep going with that so things are changing though uh, and there is a need to question uh, the predominance of this western centric approach to science and to conservation but also pushing for a change and a more inclusive and pluralistic science. Uh, the need to question. I think this is maybe the first, this is a long uh, conversation that we could be debating. I think there are a lot of things that we've already thought, maybe others we didn't. Uh, it's, it, it all sounds really obvious when talking about this. Uh, it all sounds like uh, we should all be aware of that a long time ago, but I don't think we are, or we were. And we are now looking at that. We are now looking, questioning, uh, looking at questioning ourselves and, and trying to, to do it differently. So uh, one thing that it's important is to understand how we position ourselves and how, where, uh, where we are and how, where do we look from. I'm a white woman, I'm Portuguese, I'm a European, I didn't have access to, uh, I, I didn't have barriers access barriers to education or to um, um, well economic big ones big barriers and and i've been able to to progress that way so if someone else would, would be doing this presentation or we did seeing they would have to think about where they were and what their position were and how that influences the way we communicate we, inter we interact and we collaborate which i think it's the key uh, to going going forward um, what kind of bias do we have and uh, we do have loads of bias and some are um, conscious and we know and we can work on them and many of them are unconscious and they come from all our backgrounds and we react with based on our bias and if we're not aware of them and if we don't try to think about where they are we're not going to be able to improve um, so it is it's this this reflective period and looking at us and thinking and questioning it is important uh, what is our language? And again, not necessarily just the language as uh, in this strict term, 
but how are we communicating with others in the place we work? And um, for example, we have a Kenyan colleague, a TBA alumna, who was, she was, she was saying the way um, the Global North um, partners were, or would, would, co would communicate and say, well, we need, a, we, need, so we need a local partner. After the project is developed, everything is written down. Now we get to need, we need a funding, they need a funding, they need someone to sign up and to be a partner and, and would probably reach out at this point in time. So uh, how would you feel in that position and how would, well, how would that make you feel? Um, do we want science to be like that? Do we want to actually be collaborative and we want to ask before we think what, what are the priorities maybe and not just we need a partner to do it. Um, so are we being really collaboratively or collaborative or are just ticking a box? Um, and what are our goals in research? I think obviously we all, uh, I, I less because I left academia a while ago, but we need to publish, uh, we need to advance our careers. It's how we do it in science, yes, but um, I think more than that, we do want to have um, to contribute for global science, we want to influence how things change and not just for personal or um, institutional profit. So acknowledging how these things influence us, I think it's key to understand the other's position and um, opening our research up to be challenged by others. It's also very important and can foster the kind of re reflexibility that improves the environmental and the social outcomes. And if we don't open to questions and if we don't discuss it, then um, I don't think we will be able to improve. No, sorry, the other one. I'm not gonna, we don't want to go back. Okay, so a lot to learn and to debate. I think that's the purpose here to, today also. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't want to, I'm not feeling any, <laughs> any gap. I think probably all this will, was uh, thought or said at some point, um, but there is, I feel that there is the need to talk more and to create resources uh, so that we can tap into and, and look at and read and understand what are, how can we di be different? And after questioning, what, what, how, where am I and what am I doing? So how can I change and how can I be better in terms of individuals, professionals and institutions? So TBA did, for example, uh, to suppress that need a little bit, but we did uh, um, an online course for Oxford researchers on decolonizing conservation and field work because uh, we all do field work and are we doing it uh, with, um, considering the realities in that sense. But also um, the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, uh, which is uh, a group of NGOs and the Cambridge University where TBA is part of, uh, but also Red Life International and many others, uh, created, had a symposium very recently in December um, on decolonizing conservation, when, because it's not just us individuals or one or two organizations, or we are all trying to understand better what can, how can we do better? Uh, and, and, and again, another one, two days ago, three days ago, uh, with the R Royal Society, Geographic Society of London and uh, ZSL, um, Zoological Society of London, um, a organized a, a whole day symposium on parachuting science. And it was about discussing and about um, bringing out the learning and um, advance the learning journey. So, so uh, one of the things I think is really important is to identify the barriers and the points of change and this uh, to promote the capacity and this the capacity building of the global north uh, and we should know we should learn how to do better. No, I don't think it's this one, this one, yes. So we do share a collective interest in developing conservation as a global community, uh, but we also shared a collective responsibility to do better and I think that is um, we need to assume to embrace it uh, and uh, especially and now talking about Portugal and about uh, the Portuguese speaking countries and the type of work we've at uh, universities have been doing in general and obviously this is um, not the whole the whole scenario or uh, but could be improved in how the approaches are done I think being a Portuguese I feel that there is some denial almost of uh, some some it's very uncomfortable to think about that we are somehow racist or that we discriminate but we do uh, and we need to embrace it and we need to assume and i think it, and in portugal i think we do have an extra responsibility regarding the language because if it's already somehow difficult for some of us to get to the english speaking world because we do have to upscale and go up and do conservation in english and we know that 
uh, but imagine for the people that would like to and can't even access a DBA course because if Portuguese is complicated and the access to proper education in Portuguese is complicated, imagine in English. So all this, all these barriers that are put into uh, into our uh, the Portuguese speaking countries with whom we work, I think it's our responsibility also. Um, global responsibility and in Portugal universities and governments and structures to support that step and to bring close to an equal ground in terms of conservation. There are excellent conservationists in the Portuguese speaking countries, in the tropics in general, and that those, those um, gaps and those support can also have to be a, a, a responsibility of who has more power and who had access to more privilege and more power. Um, so by keeping the status quo, we are perpetuating injustices and inhabiting collaborations from being truly collaborative. And so it would, it's good to recognize and correct mistakes and build on them. So it's not that we are trying to uh, change anything from the past, but we are definitely looking at, sorry, I can't, yeah. Okay, moving forward. Um, so uh, it's important to recognize purpose, process, and relationships with the research implementation uh, process and aim for a multilingual and uh, pluralist conservation that goes beyond our biodiversity focus and uh, get the data and come back. Uh, we need to be able to be more um, communicative and actually look at true collaborations. Uh, obviously, this doesn't go with one, two year projects, it's difficult. Uh, the funding is obviously a big limitation. Funders, donors need to be aware of that. And uh, our role as uh, receivers of the grants and uh, the funds is to try to influence that. So we are limited by the fundings. Uh, there is uh, no space to have pilots or to pre, to have a seed fund that we could go and discuss but probably that is we need to influence because that will make a difference and and we're, we can't just keep going um, with the status quo. So also capacity building and sharing I think uh, what Rosie said about the TBA courses but in general I think it is there is a lot of, of um, work to be done and how we actually engage and involve people from the, the countries we work with uh, and um, not making the assumption that there are no skilled conservationists or um, no um, skilled professionals. Uh, we need to go beyond that and, and to look and to, to provide access and skills and facilitate tools and networks when possible and when needed. Uh, but um, if, we're, if we're conservationists here, there is no reason why um, there are and people actually know the context much better, know where they live. So we are I feel that we are much more of visitors and it's a, it's it's uh, we need to feel um, to ask to be welcomed and not just uh, make ourselves at home. Um, so also address global imbalances in the access to resources and information. And I think this is really important. We have easy access to resources and information and that's related obviously with the capacity building and sharing. Uh, but this is something that uh, it's also in our hands to facilitate and especially around universities and research centers and how can we actually share data and get data to be a common thing, common ground, and not just something that we bring and publish upon. Um, and in case of Portuguese speaking countries, uh, how can we help them um, reach out, for example, for the global uh, English speaking conservation community? Uh, promote true collaboration and something called the two I seeing. So this is a concept from, um, the work with indigenous communities in America where uh, we have two eyes and we would use one eye from the sort of western centered world where we also have another eye with uh, the local perspectives and um, what and we use two eyes to see and not uh, just one pair from one of the sides and we can't change the past but we can should and need to shape a different future so, thank you Thank you very much, Mariana, for sharing this with us that many issues. I will now invite uh, Mohamed to join us. Mohamed, would you like to share your screen now? So um, thank you all for, for having me. Uh, I am uh, very sorry I'm not there uh, in 
presence because I would like that. Um, it was also super interesting, very educating to hear the, the other two talks as well. So thank you for that. And um, I am also like Mariana, not an expert in the subject at all, uh, but I would just like to share my experience because I consider to be in a very interesting position and have a point of view of someone that has been uh, on the side of, um, you know, local stakeholders and has shifted with time to, uh, to be in a position of the researcher visiting other areas. Um, so, First of all, I'd like really to for you to understand why why the hell are you listening to me today? Um, so I, I I was born to Guinea-Bissau parents uh, here in, in West Africa, and I was raised in Guinea-Bissau throughout my whole uh, young life, and then um, traveled to Portugal to do my bachelor's because there weren't any universities during my time there. Now there are some. And um, and yeah, so I was raised as any other kid from the city. I'm from Bissau. Um, so I was raised as any other kid from the city in Bissau and I went to the same schools. And I, in, at my home, I had um, a family that was very concerned about uh, giving, uh, providing opportunities for education. For us, so my grandfather did that to my mother, and my mother uh, also made all the efforts that she could to provide education opportunities to me, um, as it should be. Uh, but in that sense, I was privileged because my mother had um, the capacity of supporting my bachelor studies in Portugal. So, in that sense, I was already a bit privileged. But I also represent maybe most of the people that are now in leading positions in Guinea-Bissau come from uh, similar situations. And then um, let's say that my path uh, during my uh, life was marked by um, the support of research projects that follow good practices, which I will talk later about. Um, so I went from being an, you know, an intern in a local conservation institution. So after I did my bachelor's, I came back to Guinea-Bissau and I worked for three years as an intern, um, as a biologist. Um, and then there's this national international research project that was created back then that gave me the opportunity to work as a research and field assistant to several um, research uh, groups coming from abroad. Um, and that same project gave me the opportunity to have a master grant and then go to Portugal to do a master project. Uh, and my master project was developed in Guinea-Bissau, um, but I studied the University of Lisbon. And together with my supervisor, we developed a project uh, to work with vultures and other birds of prey there. And it, that ended up by being my first research experience uh, and it ended up by being, um, by allowing me to produce papers. And after that, and after having that opportunity, another grant from, again, another national international research project collaboration also allowed me to, 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 to continue doing research and do, doing a PhD um, abroad with a subject interest in Guinea-Bissau. And from there on, my interest in research kept on going and I am now uh, a young research in the beginning of my career. So in a certain moment, I kind of flipped between, I switched between being, you know, a local collaborator to foreign researchers to being, you know, a researcher that was coming from a university abroad to collect data. So I think that that has um, gave me an interesting insight on both uh, perspectives, I would say. And 
as a researcher, one of the things that I love are maps. I think maps tell uh, very interesting stories in a very particular way. So when we talk about making ecology global, which is the title of the paper that um, Philippa mentioned in, the, in her introductions, um, we're thinking of making a balance between the scientific knowledge, production, and sharing between the, all the countries of the world, um, regardless of their income or the opportunities. Um, and maybe most of you know this, but the world map that we are used to use uh, is represented in a very inflated way. And the North is represented in a very inflated way. So what you see here in this animation uh, is the countries in the North shrink to their real size. And whereas you can see that the South has been in general represented uh, to the true size of the, the, the areas. And this is of course a, a poetic kind of uh, analogy uh, to say that in many, in many things, um, the global North was always artificially inflated um, has with the projections of our, of our maps. So for example, in a regular map, the um, you know the, the the Russia seems much uh, larger than Africa, and uh, you know North America and Canada seems huge, but in, in in fact Africa is incredibly large. And I will now focus the rest of my talk in Africa because that's what I know best. Um, and maybe some generalizations can be made to the rest of low income areas but I will focus in Africa. And in the paper of uh, Nunez et al. in 2021, they did another map, I love maps, which represent the world, but with the countries showing the sizes of the scientific production. And again, we see an inflation, an inflation of the North regarding the number of papers they produce, and the knowledge they produce, and the knowledge that is made available. And this um, looks at scientific production between 96 and, and uh, 2019. Um, so this is a fact. This is not an opinion. This is not, um, you know, um, uh, subject for debate. And if we look at more facts, we can see that there's an inequality in the scientific production, of course, and both in the, you know, the numbers of papers that can be accessed. Um, and the number of papers that are published. Um, and you can see here that Sub-Saharan Africa has a much smaller number of papers published per million compared to um, you know, Europe or North America. Um, and even in the rate of acceptance of the papers, um, there's a, 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 a huge gap there. Um, so these again are facts that our numbers showing what is the range of the inequality in scientific production. And Nunez et al. in 2019 tried to understand what's the source of this inequality. And they came up with the proportion of English speakers being a very significant um, variable, but also the investment of the country in research and development and the gross, um, the GDP of, of, of the countries, the gross domestic, domestic production. Right, so this is the facts that are published in papers that look at this, but then we can look at this and say, well, okay, there's a lot of production in the North, but um, there's also a lot of collaborations, of course. So there's a lot of papers that are attributed to the North that actually come from low-income countries. And I also give a look at that and try to see, you know, what's the number of um, of uh, a percentage of uh, publications of research that are carried in low-income countries that are made in collaboration with local researchers. And this uh, chart shows for four different uh, areas in uh, in uh, in science, and and we can see, of course, that the proportion of papers that are published without collaboration with local stakeholders showed in black are overall 
uh, much, much, uh, much higher. And then uh, also uh, Guy et al. in 2019 analyzed the difference in the networking between the different uh, continents in collaborations of papers uh, published. Um, and we can see that, you know, there were an improvement between, you know, Europe and maybe Asia, but Africa remained with a very low um, you know, level of uh, collaboration in science with the other continents. Again, these are numbers and facts. And, you know, to make ecology global, um, there are, of course, many, many barriers, and, uh, and some of the speakers have talked about that before. And the language barrier, of course, then I'm not going uh, a lot uh, to talk a lot about that. Uh, but also, there's a historical context, um, you know, all the colonialism, geopolitics, imbalance in power. And there's also the context of research funding in the North, uh, as uh, uh, Mariana was saying, everyone knows FCT, but not only FCT, but the way funding of science is structured in the North or well, in high income countries, um, it's also very restrictive for scientists. And also there's a lack of local capacity and resources in, 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 in low income countries, of course, as a result of all the barriers. Um, but that also can result in a lack of interest in science in general in those areas, because there are priorities and there's a lot of basic essential developmental things that are not secured in low income areas. And those become a priority, of course, in terms of investment, and therefore science is, is not in the top of the list there. So what I talk I talked about, those are barriers that are very general, that are applied to the structures. But I would like now to talk a bit more from the perspective of uh, you know a normal scientist in the in a high income area or you know in the north. Um, what are the things that um, we control? What are the things that you know we should be worried about? What where can we you know uh, intervene? What can we do? And you know. Um, Guy et al. in 2019 uh, referred uh, five types of, um, you know, uh, barriers that are within our reach. Um, and I think that many of them make sense. Uh, of course, regarding the priorities, it has to do with the way that we structure our own research projects. And, um, you know, and that, that, that has to do with how that we think, how that we, we think the time allocation during our research, when we when we when we go to the field, it has to do with, you know, what's the time that we invest in collecting data and what's the time that we invest in sharing data um, and in communicating with others. Um, there's also the, a matter of the, the culture, the culture of science. How do we do science? How do we perceive science? How do we behave? And the type of relationships that you try to foster with um, local stakeholders or the absence of relationships when you talk about, you know, the parachute science or the helicopter science, like I, I like to I like to call it because they also need to get out. Um, and it's also in our control to think about what is fair data and knowledge flow. Uh, which is the need, you know, to, 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 for us to be, as researchers, to be aware of the importance of, the, of making the research global, making the knowledge being circular, not only um, unidirectional. And uh, so we need to be, as researchers, active in pushing forward, you know, changes towards making ecology more global, towards making research more global, and we can be more active in promoting opportunities and to exchange with peers in, in, in low income areas. Um, and this round table is an excellent example of that. Uh, of course, TBA, it's another excellent example of that. Uplori 
for those that know that initiative, it's also in Nigeria. It's also an excellent example of that. So creating opportunities for us to be exposed to the ideas of low-income countries, researchers, and for also low-income country researchers have the opportunity to be exposed to our limitations because sometimes we just have the wrong expectations of each other. Sometimes, you know, we are in Guinea-Bissau and there's this bunch of researchers that come with GPS and binoculars and da da da. And the, our expectation is that, okay, those guys have a lot of money, they have a lot of resources, uh, they could also invest in, you know, giving a talk or maybe um, having a course going on. But no, they just take data and go out. And researchers in low income areas also need to understand that researchers that are coming from outside are restricted in some way by the structure of the, the, the funding, by the time, and why they are restricted. So the, the, creating these opportunities for exchanging, it's, it's super important. Um, so as I told you, I was put in a position that I might have a unique perspective of uh, the issue of making ecology global, making research global. And I've been and I've seen several real life examples of bad practices that I consider bad practices. And, and these you know, have to do with unidirectional relationships and this helicopter science, data harvesting and the lack of long term commitment. Um, and this and, and, and this, of course, can be, you know, the project goals that usually are exclusively concerned to the needs and interests of the North, and because they are designed in the North, even though some many times we're talking about, uh, you know, migratory birds or um, habitats that are of global concern, um, you know, project timing that exclusively adapted to the timing of the foreign researchers and institutions is also another bad practice that I've seldom seen in a researcher going to Guinea-Bissau, um, you know, exploitation of local human resources like collaborators, technicians and institutions without a fair rewarding or exchange. And that's also something that happens a lot and we can discuss it uh, further in the, in the, in the, during this uh, round table. And um, I've also seen the respectful behaviors towards local communities and institutions because many times we're not aware of the rules of access to the, our study areas, do they, you know, do they belong to like traditional community and how should we proceed? And many times this is also uh, disregarded uh, because of the, um, you know, unique position of power that uh, we come when we have more, you know, more, 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 more money, more resources uh, when we go to other areas. And, uh, and, you know, very little investment in capacity building as well. That's some of the, you know, several bad practices that I have identified and that I think that many of them are really in our power to change. Um, and many times researchers go to the field and we don't really have time to invest in knowledge sharing, neither before we arrive, like before we go to the field, or even after we analyze the data and we have our results, we don't have time enough to give feedback to the areas where we went to collect the data. And sometimes that feedback that is quite relevant for the managing of those areas or you know, for the local knowledge and, 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 and things like that. And, um, so that's that's also very important to do when we we get the results and the project has ended to give feedback, and uh, you know the project goals are not communicated to local communities, so we just go and collect data. People see us go and leave, and they don't know what we're doing there, and what's the use of all that, and you know. And another example of a uh, bad practice, and I can you know. Uh, it's the lack of time commitment to develop strong relationships and long-term relationships with areas where we work. Uh, projects are often short, it's, we're in and out and we're gone. And you know, there are sporadic, sporadic capacity building, bu building efforts sometimes to just give a field course of two, two days and that's not enough 
um, to to really build things up. And um, you know, there's no time to build trust and leave the legacy. And that's something that it's a beautiful legacy from the TBA course. It's this long-term commitment of doing something um, very structured and 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 thinking about uh, leaving a legacy uh, to the to the future. So, and of course, all these uh, bad practices uh, have consequences and. Um, Many of them, of course, are related to typ typification of researchers, and uh, you know, uh, there's a, there's 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 a bunch of uh, bad experiences that uh, sometimes local communities can uh, be subjected to, and then you know, all researchers are the same, and all so all the teams coming from abroad, they are data harvesters, and it is that's not true. But the fact is that we share a collective responsibility, as as uh, as it was also said. Uh, by Rosie, and um, when the, the way we behave, the, the, the type of science that we do when we go to these low-income countries, they they don't own, they not only represent ourselves and our group at our university, but they represent all the community of scientists. So we need to be aware of this collective responsibility, and this creates, of course, tense relationships between researchers and local actors. Um, which can result, and I've seen it, uh, to blocked or cancelled projects that were ongoing. Um, and, and then, you know, there's a lack of data on these key areas of the globe because of these tensions. And we can, you know, have undetected changes and declines that passed unnoticed. And, um, you know, this ends up by creating um, a very biased knowledge of the glo glo global ecology, ecological patterns. Uh, because we have an imbalanced set of data and imbalanced set of uh, production and uh, we don't have long-term data in these areas that are so important. And the only way of having long-term data is, of course, for local researchers and local uh, stakeholders to be able to develop their own research in their own areas. That's the only way that we can use with the very little resources that exist for science for us to be able to have long-term long data on these important areas as well. And after talking so negatively, and I'm sorry about these bad practices that I've really came across during my short uh, uh, experience, professional experience, I've also came across very good and excellent examples of good practices that actually work and they leave a legacy. And I would like to, 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 to mention a few. Um, and I would start, I would like to start with the example of the sea turtle monitoring and research in Guinea-Bissau and particularly in the Bijagos archipelago. This was started back in the, you know, in the eighties with uh, uh, this Portuguese researcher, Paulo Catri, which was very interested in, 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 in uh, sea turtles there. And, um, and then, the way things were built in this initiative is that everything from the start was built together with local institutions and local researchers from the beginning. And it was possible to get funding for, uh, you know, a multinational, multi-partner um, uh, uh, consortium that could uh, then work on monitoring sea turtles in a very important area. Um, it's the third most important rookery for green turtles in, in, in that sense. And that has been developed throughout the years with a long-term commitment. And, you know, capacity building was a, always a priority there. And uh, it ended up by creating um, a lot of opportunities, a lot of contact with local communities, because the area where the sea turtles are is also an area that um, is sacred by a few communities that live nearby and all these connections were very well managed and were managed always in a very collaborative context and this 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 project still is going on and it was constructed in a way that now the monitoring is independent from outside researchers so there's enough capacity both in the institutions that work in conservation, but also in the local communities and the young from the local communities with very low education levels that are able 
to teach master students that are now coming from Portugal or from elsewhere to do their research there in the island. Um, and then th this was also possible because there was a, 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 um, a commitment with capacity building at a high level. And um, this man was the first person to be supported by this project to do his master. And he became the leader of this initiative until this very day. He's still there, he's an example. And it's because of him that this was possible. And he has the capacities just because someone had the vision to understand that it is important to build high level capacity as well. And uh, that person um, I'm talking, it's not a person, it's a group of researchers and Paulo Catra is among of them leading that. And I think that this is an excellent example. And ever since there was more master students from both from Guinea-Bissau and from Portugal that were, um, you know, generated during this project. So it's, uh, for me, it's a very good example to show that things, it's possible to make it work. And the most important thing that I wanted to tell is that not only it's possible to make this together with local communities and local institutions, it's also possible to make it very productive scientifically. So this is just a part of the many papers and there are even books that were produced for this monitoring data that has been collecting and all this um, you know, participative research. So it is possible to do it and it is possible to make it profitable and it is possible. Um, to raise capacities in a way that we have better data, long-term data collected by local researchers. And, um, you know, there's another example that I will also like to, to mention, which was the project that supported me and allowed me to be the researcher that I am becoming now. Um, it's a, a, a project that was also involved several institutions, the same structure as the, the, the Sea Turtle Initiative. So uh, built from the scratch together with local institutions and that in, included technicians from the conservation institutions uh, to, you know, master students and researchers coming from uh, abroad, they could share experiences and the way that the community was involved in this project was very special because we used, um, for example, for the Timne parrot research that was conducted during this project, uh, we used uh, local former um, hunters of uh, gray parrots that were converted to conservation, which had incredible knowledge to share of how to find these birds, where to find them, what were the daily patterns, and it was incredibly useful to, of course, structure the research projects that were ongoing uh, and make it possible to even reach the nest sometimes. Um, and uh, I, I also benefited from this project, and, and, and in this project, other Guinea-Bissau people were, were uh, trained and had the opportunity to, to do their master. Also in the pelagic fish and predator uh, research but within the same project. Um, these uh, pictures show the members of the communities which are young people that are fishermen, they know the areas, they can help the researchers find the best, the best, best areas and, and, and to understand what's the best way of sampling and they can also help to sample and they can also learn to do the other parts of the, 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 the sample processing. And this was also uh, for, it was a lot of, uh, it was very interesting because not only the local research, the local community um, was able to be, you know, target of capacity building and to be included in this research and to understand the meaning of the research and why, but also the students that came abroad, from abroad uh, were able to really learn from these local institutions. And they're certainly the way they see science was also changed because they were involved in such type of project and they could work together with local institutions and understand that, you know, these guys can learn and they can do it and they can then keep on doing it by themselves. 
Um, and my specific master was uh, focused in uh, vultures and birds of prey, which was also the same type of experience, uh, uh, researchers coming from abroad and helping me learn how to identify all these difficult uh, birds of prey and how to structure my research, how to do it. And it was very enriching for me and that changed, of course, my life um, in a very positive way. And again, this project was very productive scientifically. There's a lot of uh, uh, and master theses, a PhD theses that came out of it, and then a very collaborative book in the end of the, the project. And something that I also liked a lot was the fact that in the end of the project, there were, you know, it was budgeted to have a, a, a field trip that was basically us going back there to present all the results that we got and everything that we found out and how did that matter to the local communities and to the institutions there. And that feedback in the end was also uh, very special and very important and for me a good example. And yeah, and just to you know wrap things up, um, pitching in my opinion, um, I would like before giving you my opinion on what we could do as researchers uh, I also like to 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 share this. Uh, this paper was um, published um, in, in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, and suggested five shifts that we as researchers have to do that could help to transform academic ecological practice and make it more global. But the fact is that you know these five shifts are. For me, very interesting. Decolonize your mind, know your histories, decolonize access, decolonize expertise, and practice ethical ecologic, ecolo ecology in inclusive teams. But I then realized that, you know, um, this, this is overly theoretical and it uses a lot of aggressive language. And, in my point of view, this is not very productive. This is not the way we're going to change things. The decolonizing type of uh, expressions can be very antagonizing. And this is not the, the, the best way of getting there. And in that sense, I would just take this and transform it a bit. And instead of calling it decolonizing your mind, we need as researchers to be aware of what the problem is why is it important? So why is it important to make ecology global? Why does it matter? And that we are part of it. We are part of the problem and we can also be part of the solution. And instead of, you know, knowing your histories, because that's a bit, you know, you're not, you don't have to know the, you know, ancient history of every place you're going to work because that's not fair to ask from us researchers. We have already enough in our plates. But we need to try to be aware of the historical and, and geopolitical context, because those will help us understand a lot why things are in the ways they are and how they can be changed and what's our role in changing that. And instead of decolonizing access, I would say build real and fair collaborative projects from the very beginning. Uh, a bit in the spirit of the examples that I that talked about before, uh, build a project from the scratch together with this, uh, with, with the local partners, local institutions, um, you know, be fair about what are we taking from that country in terms of data and what can we give back? We need to be um, aware of that. Um, and and that's, that's for me, one of the most important um, changes that need to happen. And instead of saying decolonize expertise, I would say promote fair data flow and knowledge sharing. Um, you know, it's important through capacity building, investing time and efforts and um, to do honest exchanges, integrating local, local, local knowledge. That's all very, very, very important as well. And last but not least, practice, instead of practice ethical, ecology and inclusive teams. I actually like that one, so I'll just keep it um, because this one is actually a good term um, because we, we need to respect local culture when we go to the field. We need to understand the rules of access, access to those areas 
and then we need to observe proper behavior in the spirit of the areas that we are. We cannot bring our, um, let's say, we cannot bring all of our beliefs into the other countries. We need to be able to you know, fuse and integrate well and understand our, by our diversity and our differences. And that will help to promote fair co-authorship attributions as well, because if we're, you know, honest and ethical in, in, in ecology and we work with someone that helped us collect more than half of our, our samples, we should share co-authorship with uh, those people as well. And, and I'm also very keen to, to, to say that not only PIs and, you know, experienced researchers, but especially students need to observe this these behaviors and have this science culture because students are often those that spend the most time in the field, like I did, and like you know others like you also did, and those are the one that local stakeholders see every day. So they especially also need to observe these um, these 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 behaviors. And I'd like to end with this quoting from Patrice Lumumba, which was uh, a, a great uh, leader in the Republic of Congo. And this sentence, I would like, with this sentence, I would like to tell you that it's not only our, the role of European or you know, Western or Northern researchers to engage in improving global ecology, but it's also the role of us Africans or people from low, in, low income areas to also work towards changing this. We need to know how to demand researchers that are coming to, you know, you need to take me to the field. You need to take this guy to the field. You need to, you know, are you doing this research? Just help this guy understand what you're doing and teach him these field techniques or, you know, we as Africans, we also need to be able to change our minds and uh, protect ourselves and develop ourselves and stop always blaming the white guy. So that's the way I see things. And I thank you all for your attention and sorry for taking so long. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mohamed, for sharing all those uh, thoughts and views with us. I'd like now to invite Rosie and Mariana to join here. And uh, Mohamed, if you could still uh, be with us now, we will yeah. open a discussion. So I would also like to invite uh, those who are joining us online, those who are in YouTube to submit their questions. Uh, and also those who are in Zoom to raise uh, your hands. So, and I will start by doing myself a question. Uh, I think that, so the, the talks were actually a bit longer than, than I was expecting, but on the other hand, I, I also, uh, I will not need to do some questions I thought initially, because those were pretty much discussed uh, in the presentations. And so my first question is, uh, so first I would like to share the difficulty we had in coming up with the title for this round table. Uh, in the beginning, I thought by calling that, that something like uh, decolonizing ecology, uh, how can we, um, I think it was something like uh, avoid colonial practices or something. And, uh, and then we thought that maybe that was not the right word sometimes because it has a, a, a quite a negative connotation, but also because sometimes it's not really the, the right word, it's not just the case. So I would like to ask your thoughts about that and uh, how do you think we can approach the, this issue that I'm calling just an issue? So, uh, and the, the, so the questions are open for the three panelists. Does this work? Yeah. I, I think I think uh, Mohammed answered it actually. <laughs> I thought um, so. One of the issues about using the word decolonizing is um, 
is that it could be antagonistic. And I think sometimes, sometimes we use it because we want to challenge ourselves. At the same time, it has so many other connotations as well. And I think that, um, that that's why we were, we, we were borrowing the term um, parachute science, but it's also been called um, helicopter science because after all, if you parachute in, you've got to get out somehow. So um, the helicopter science is very visual and it could apply to anybody, whether you're wherever, whatever country you're from. And so that perhaps is, uh, is quite a useful term and it implies something quite short term, doesn't it? You kind of helicopter in and then you helicopter out. So I thought it was as a visual um, metaphor, I think it works really well and it doesn't antagonize. And while it is important that we said we should challenge ourselves, we, you know, we have, you know, we, including myself, I know I've, I've not used best practice. At the same time, we want everyone to join in. We need, a, we need the whole community to join in. And if people get antagonized or stop arguing about the, the meaning of the term, you just move away from the actual issue itself. I personally uh, also like that term too. And I, I thank Mohammed for uh, telling the, uh, this since the beginning. <laughs> That's quite useful. Uh, now, uh, Richard would like to. to just Can I just add while the microphone goes around? Um, I completely agree with the visual effect of the helicopter, and uh, that is probably the, the, the best one uh, to describe. And, and I completely agree with Rosie on, on the. It's something that needs to bring us all in, to bring it all in. But I also feel that the helicopter doesn't bring any discomfort that all this should bring. And in a way, so not not uh, helicopter actually sounds interesting and comfortable. Um, so it's sort of, I think there should be there, there's something that um, uh, that it, there's a responsibility or there's something serious about this and uncomfortable that about the, the topic uh, that I'm not questioning the name. So, but that is also should also be present uh, because it shouldn't be something completely light in the sense that. Um, I think it needs to be a serious discussion going forward and a serious change going forward. So um, not disagreeing on anyone, but on the other way, on the other way, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Great. Uh, thanks very much, much everyone, the fantastic talks. Um, I have one small comment uh, and one question. The, the, the comments, uh, perhaps I'll lose my job for it, but I'm a bit disappointed that there's not more senior people from CBO present today because I think one of the issues is that often we're not getting to the senior people and they're the ones that often are the gatekeepers, they're the ones that, that often, because of the structure of science in Europe, North America, they're the ones that can have the most influence. So, you know, I'm, let's, hope they're not. let's hope they're not listening. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope they're all mine. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, my, my question is that uh, several of you mentioned trust as being a, a really important issue. How do you build trust in these relationships? You know, from uh, often from, you know, uh, when you're starting a new project and you're going out and you don't know people, how, how do you actually get that trust when maybe uh, they've already had some bad experiences such as the ones that Mohammed has mentioned. Uh, so what do you think the, the key issues are for Mohammed, would you like to answer? Start by answering? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, to say that I don't have the answer because um, like you, I am faced with this challenge every time. Uh, but then, from my own experience, I just think that if before you start a project, you get in touch with your with your potential stakeholders, that goes a long way in in you integrating a lot of ownership from local uh, local stakeholders into your own project, and I think that that helps a lot also it helps you to feel more safe and to have more support in an area that you don't know and then you know you know you cannot 
guess all the different rules that exist. So you really need to go through local partners when possible. And, you know, sometimes it's not possible and that's called an expedition like the, in the old days. <laughs> but um, we, I think that we always need to try to remember to think about this. But so I don't think people don't think about this because they're mean or they're evil or they, they want to inflate the norm. No, it's just a matter of culture. So um, just like the advancements that we did with, um, you know, gender equality, it's exactly the same, I think. Just need to remember and think about it and then, you know, go through the local partners when possible and think about giving feedback. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to add? I totally agree. I think it, it takes time. So that I think there's the issue. We know that building trust takes time. So, so and often we're challenged whether we're an NGO or whether you're a researcher is how do you do a project whereby you do involve people right at the beginning? So it's not the issue that I know um, Mariana mentioned one of our alumni who, who participated in the symposium we held. And she said, she's Kenyan, and she said, the thing is, people came to her once they'd written the project, they've designed the project, and now they need the local partner. So can you be the local partner? And of course, we're going to work with you. But the project's already been designed. And often it's been done by email, because people haven't gone out to visit her. And let's talk through it first. So how do you get your, the people, the gatekeepers and the people holding the grants to allow you to put that into your grant at the beginning? And, in, and ideally, if you were writing the grant at the beginning, you'd say, I can't tell you exactly what we're going to do because I haven't talked to my partners yet. <laughs> but you can't do that in write, when you write a grant. So it's really tricky. Although I would say, um, although Skype and Zoom and other IT is available, we're using it much better now. So we can, you know, we're, we're having, much, even though it was available beforehand, People didn't use it when they were planning the projects, but since COVID, people are using it much more. So actually, you can you can use that you can use that opportunity to talk much much earlier on in your projects. Now you don't have you know in the past I think psychologically we thought you have to travel there, which is better. But now you can actually I mean not building it with local communities. I mean building it with your research partner or the TBA alumni we were talking about. So actually, we can start that whole process much much earlier. Thank you very much. Can I just add two things? Uh, expectations, and I think that's important. Not create or not to come with expectations that you're not going to commit to uh, because you wouldn't like it the other way around either. And I think that's, that's an important thing with trust and be open-minded to change. So not being um, like our lens is the one that's right and I'm going to have to do it this way. And um, so if you are open-minded to change also uh, and open to, to the fact that the expertise is also on the other side and uh, and that needs to have a, a dialogue. Yeah, we, we talk about this a lot in group, we under promise and over deliver. <laughs> but the, this thing about trust taking time, I think there's also, uh, there's an institutional element of this because often institutions don't encourage the longer term commitments. Yeah, and ownership. Okay, so, so uh, there's, uh, so now we will uh, allow someone from Zoom to make herself a question. Uh, is it open, the microphone? Yeah. Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, so I have, it's a bit of a comment and a question as well. Uh, so before, I'm currently a first year PhD, uh, but before that I was working in Cabo Verde for eight years in conservation. So I do recognize a lot of, of the things that were talked here, and I think they were very um, into the point and very relevant. Um, but my personal struggle was, um, so we are trying to apply conservation in a place where uh, Mohamed also said, they are very basic needs that haven't been fulfilled yet. Um, so when we're trying to, and obviously there's all the all the strategies of providing cap capacity building and even long-term economic alternatives as well. 
Uh, so say, for example, uh, try to change the thing about turtle meat consumption uh, and try to explain the importance of, of you know, marine turtles role uh, and all of this. But these are usually things that, you know, take years. It's not something that you usually do from one day to the other. Um, so as a PhD student, how could we, I guess, contribute to, to make sure we're being, uh, you know, providing uh, and, and providing for this exchange. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you hear well the question? No. Enough, I think. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understood because it goes, the sound goes up and down. But if I'm not wrong, it's about how can you actually, um, as a PhD student, uh, promote um, something realistic that will actually contribute for a change? Um, one example would be to to have to try to have someone that will would work with you throughout the process of, of the PhD uh, that would be either uh, hosted by the same or other university that would be uh, local to to the place and that would keep on uh, um, will would have the same uh, inputs or the would work closely and having the inputs that uh, would share the share them throughout the work uh, and that could continue and and promote that work after uh, you are finished, for example. Um, I don't know if anyone Mohammed, else you. wants to contribute. Mohammed? Yeah, sure. Um, because I've, I so easily can understand Sara's point, because even though I'm from Guinea-Bissau, I come from Bissau, from the city. My field work during the PhD was in the islands. And I must tell you this funny story. So I would stay in the center of this island and then go to the mud flats to work every day. And I would use a bike to go back and forth. And in my path, I would cross a couple of villages and I just could ride in the middle of them and throw them to the, to the beach and then to the mud flat. Um, and every time, when I was going, kids would come out and say, branco, 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 and, which means white guy, white guy, white guy. And, I, you know, as kids were kids and just, and this, this time where like, I was counting short birds and the plane went over and I lost all the birds. And then I was coming back a bit upset and they were going to get branco, branco. And I was, I stopped and I approached them and said, why do you call me? Branco, I am your color, right? He said, yes. Am I not black as you are? And he said, yes. And I was, why do you call me Branco? Because you act like a white, you dress like a white, and you have expensive gear on you. <laughs> <laughs> so I was um, exactly in your position in that sense. So what I felt I needed to do was every two or three times I was crossing by I would come a bit earlier and spend half an hour with the people in the village really and sometimes this can be difficult because there's a language barrier but I have colleagues that do not speak Creole or Portuguese that did that also and people just love it and even spend, spend 10, 10 minutes with the villagers you know sit down with a guy or just whatever and talk to him and exchange and he will tell you a nice story or maybe ask you for money. But if you do that often, they will not ask you for money every time because you then, they are, you are an acquaintance of them and they get used to you. That's one with local communities. And another tip I would give you is when you get to a place as a PhD student, depends on- uh, We lost you, Mohammed, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Still? Oh, Hello? Sounds, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, no? I really enjoyed your tip. <laughs> I have the same issue. Um, you're still not hearing me. That must be... Sarah, can That's you hear Something me? in the uh, meantime. It's back. It's back. Okay. So the yes, people... Yes. You're back. Yeah? Yeah. You're back. And a very quick tip. Um, 
is that, you know, when you get to a place as a PhD student, please find a local university, go there and give a talk and try to find a student to, to work with you. Just, just, you know, just do that. That's so easy to do in most places. So that's another tip. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So Ross. Well, I was going to add, but Sarah, I might have misinterpreted some of what you said, but um, when we, we organized, we, we designed and, and created um, an online training course um, called Decolonizing Fieldwork. Um, and yes, it was meant to kind of promote this, um, promote feeling uncomfortable. Actually, the problem with that is it, it backfired because the PhD students were feeling uncomfortable and they didn't, and it was, it was kind of difficult for them. As a PhD student, you know, you're part of a community of PhD students, but you're in a research group, you have a supervisor in your home university. And what, what we found from the, when we talked about to the um, university students, we were doing our online course was they felt they did want to have more voice and they wanted to talk to their supervisors and say to their supervisors, you know, we, we feel uncomfortable because we have this wonderful PhD, but we haven't, we know it hasn't been totally co-designed and we haven't been able to go out and do this earlier, um, sort of recce and talk to people. And so they actually, um, have a, they wanted to, they do have a voice and they wanted to use their voice. And I do think that, um, uh, that's important that you can be able to talk to your research institution, wherever you're based back in your home institution to say, this is the issue. This is how I feel. Um, I don't want to feel that I'm going to be this short term PhD and then I'm going to disappear and the whole project finishes. So what can you do to help this? Is this is this going to be a long term project whereby I'm one part of it and then somebody else will come and then somebody else in it so that you can build that long term um, commitment? And I think it's partly uh, partly it's it can be tough, but to to have the courage to talk with your supervisor about it, with your institution, because ultimately they were probably the ones that maybe got the grant or had they have they maybe have more power in a way than you um, and they have probably more access to the money. And so I think that um, being able to talk to your own institution and, and helping that change as well is really important. Thank you very much, Rosie. So there was one question before. Ah, OK, I'm sorry. Um, is there so need over there has a question? Sorry. And thank you, Sarah. So my question is for Rosie. Is related to what you just said. Um, so after being for so long in the TBA, and given that the TBA, the TBA court balancing between European and how do you, how is your perception that now that this decolon, decolonial discussion is progressing more? How do you feel that this is affecting the African and the European students? Is their perception on research? You think this improves or not? How do they feel towards it? Do you feel that there is a change because of the discussion or not? Well, y y yes, I do, because I mean, partly that's the kind of feedback that we get from people and however, however much I think we all, you know, we all want to um, do good. We often have values where we say we, you know, we want to do the best, but we've still lived in our own lived world, in our own lived experience. And what I've what I've seen when people come on a TBA course, it, it's a month long for a start. It is very, very culturally diverse. And we also um, behind the scenes, we kind of um, design it to allow people to mix quite well and quite freely. And uh, you might have noticed <laughs> sometimes you don't get a choice of which group you're in. And then you go, oh, that's interesting. There's lots of different countries on this group. Um, and so by the end of the course, we we hear people saying, you know, that was really interesting. I've, I've really learned um, about not just other culture, which is interesting, but also their education so far. And people have said that they understand that um, they understand that people have gone through slightly different education systems. And that's really useful to know. So that perhaps right at the beginning of the course, people thought they were talking the same language, but they weren't. They were kind of missing. And then by the end of the course, they 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 kind of understood it. So I think it builds builds an understanding that uh, that um, 
there are there, there are different approaches to science and they're equally important and that that and actually the value is when you bring them to the two together and you can bring your own perspectives and you can bring other others perspectives and if you put those together you're going to get a much richer and more rounded um more rounded product whether it's res research or or conservation so i have i have seen that and i think um it's an amazing uh it's, it's amazing to see it and that's the feedback that we get from people but i but also that you know the important thing is that everyone on on that course has expertise and has really useful views every single person does and that's what's so important that we we need that open forum to be able to listen to them Ah, okay. The people's mindset. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. This is because we are oh, okay. people. Um, comparing courses uh -huh. 15 years yeah. ago from today, yeah. if people go with different uh -huh. uh, approaches to this topic and more aware, or I see what you if mean. you see if yeah. you see that. Well, I'll ask Marion to say as well because she was on a course last year. But I I I noticed that um, I think there is more awareness. I mean, I think. Uh, it must be the case that having a more globally connected world through social media and so on, I think is more aware. I would hope that people coming from their institutions are more open-minded. People are much more aware of the importance of um, avoiding things like helicopter science. I, yeah, I agree. I think people have come with um, slightly more experience of understanding other other cultures, but they, but nevertheless, the, the actual chance to really find out about it directly. But um, I, I guess that's true. Yes, there's, there is more awareness, and there's also what's amazing for me is just seeing the potential in the young people coming on the courses because their 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 potential and expertise is also even higher than uh, 15 years ago. Thank you very much. So I have just a quick question. Is it okay if we extend for more 15 minutes? Because it's now half past five. Is it okay? No, no one will come. Okay, so uh, Javi, do we have any question from YouTube? No? Okay, so maybe we can pass the word to Martin. Okay, but maybe just following on Rosie. So I, I agree that um, it's, it's really amazing having all the uh, different cultures coming together to share different world views. And this and this basically makes us seeing the world in different ways that we haven't even expected to see before. But then I think, and that this can inform our scientific um, interests and uh, what we want to do. But I would say that that science itself is a, it's a method that is universal rather than uh, specific to different uh, countries. So it's uh, so I wouldn't say there is there is a Western centric way of doing science. I think there is a way of doing science that has been going on since I think humans start looking at nature and trying to live along. And, and it's in, in it's in the different knowledge systems and it's uh, it started maybe then to be more formalized maybe in Egypt and then Greece and then but I wouldn't try to put this uh, label again maybe the white man's guilt that this is something I, I don't I think it's universal and that's the beauty of it you know so and I think everyone north and south uh, agree that do science want to see it like that I would imagine if not it I, I don't know that's my view um also this then then i was just thinking about this here for now with this helicopter science thing so um first there is this structural problem that most science nowadays it's um funded for short term so we would like to have long-term projects to understand the ecology and everything lots of people would like so but structurally we have to do two years projects and then when you want to apply to a new one you cannot be in the same you have to do another one so by default so that's the problem of the gatekeepers we lots of the science will be short term um, uh, then then maybe also in terms of the questions of science maybe here we are more talking about the conservation so this makes us, but in terms of fundamental science i think it, it's also good there will people there will be people that have their own questions and they're fascinated about the subject so they, they come with their question and then where can i answer it and they maybe it's in this country a good study system so they will come with the answer with the question already and so they will, and this I think it's valid as well. And then people there accept or not, but uh, if they can help or not. But so, 
you don't always need to start from the scratch with the either it doesn't need to be north south or, or anything so um and even then this and then and in relation to biodiversity because of this structural problem of the short term uh, the short term funding maybe lots of um, helicopter science it, are still producing something in a way uh, filling up gaps and then they have to publish the results and then and then they create some maybe critical mass will come out of it still because people are being exposed to science everywhere a bit so it's not the best way but maybe we cannot just put it aside because not everyone can do long-term projects or not all projects can aim to leave a legacy uh, that's uh, maybe that's quite uh, to be nice but uh, maybe sometimes uh, so ju just looking at also the other side not to... so my one of my questions was, I'll, I'll just add something to what martin just said so one of my questions was that Given that uh, this short term science will continue to happen, what can still uh, be done uh, given that will happen anyway? How can we still improve? Sorry, very quickly, I, I, I think you're um, probably very more very broad minded, but going back to the earlier question about science, I think maybe or maybe you misinterpreted me, but I'm reflecting what Mariana said is that I have had teachers coming on a TBA course who have from outside the region saying, my scientific question is, is more interesting than that one. So it wasn't that the fundamental approach of science is, is different, but the, the, I have seen a change in a good way because I have had some teachers who've said, well, yeah, no, but that, that, that research isn't very good or interest, or sorry, isn't interesting. We ought to be looking at this. And so there's very much a value judgment, which was very much coming from the global North being imposed and uh, and that's what I think personally. I think um, is uh, it, you know is what we want to change because first of all it it shows a rather one way of looking at things and secondly it's not and it's not being open minded. So I didn't mean the way you do science. It was more the priorities and often priorities are being set by people with their values from elsewhere. I mean, you, you may you, you may disagree, but what I, what I found is that uh, that uh, that is happening less anyway. But I have. I have found that sometimes people have been putting a judgment in, on what is interesting, what should be the priority when it's coming from not that region. And maybe just to add to that, and I agree, and, and I think one, one thing, so not science itself is, is the same across the world, but the type of, again, I'm, I'm knocking the language, but the type of nomenclature that you use, how you, how you sort of prioritize uh, the themes and the topics, is very much dictated in, in, in the global north and sort of just keeps changing like ecosystem services go to nature based solutions go to this go to that so maybe some some those topics are more related to conservation so maybe not so uh, fundamental science that is kind of less applied uh, but when we're talking about um, more applied science around conservation uh, there is there is uh, this kind of momentum that keeps going and it keeps changing and it's I, I feel, and, and again, this is all very uh, personal in many ways, but uh, that feels that it's it's led um, by the, the global north. And I, I think that it's interesting that that um, with the helicopter science analogy is that if people are coming from out completely outside with more resources and are coming to do their science, that is at the expense of the people that they're working with. So perhaps they're not rewarding them fairly, or they're taking the data away and not sharing it. Then I think helicopter science is not okay. I think the ethics of it needs to be considered at the same time as this, you know, f forwarding science for the sake of it. I think it's a really difficult one to look at. But I think if it's done at the expense of the host country, then I think then helicopter science is not okay. Yeah, I would uh, also like to add something. Is it possible? Sure. Yeah, um, I really appreciate Martin's comment because I think it's extremely important for us to still realize when we are in this type of roundtables, we tend to stick to the, you know, um, to, the, to the politically correct thinking that seems to emerge from the roundtable. But the issue that Martin is raising, it's very real. Uh, we as researchers, we are still bound to this small, short-term, very unfunded <laughs> projects that are still very important and they still need to happen. And we still need to cover those areas. 
and I really appreciate that comment. And my opinion is that to this making ecology global problem, there's not only one solution because uh, initiatives like TBA are very focused on capacity raising and not particularly, they're not comparable to a, a regular research project focused on a research question. Initiatives like, you know, um, uh, conservation, even conservation work, it's much more easy to relate that to making ecology global or making research global, let's say, than this very focused fundamental or even applied research project. So in my view, where TBA and those kinds of initiatives are contributing in a specific way that is very important, we as researchers can also make small contributions that will add up in the areas that we work. So if I, for example, have a three-year project or a two-year project, and I go to, I don't know, uh, India, I go to Guinea-Bissau or I go to whatever, and every time I go there, I work with this guy. He's my student. I take, it, take him to the field and he's helping me. So I'm benefiting from that. But I'm sharing knowledge with him. So he's benefiting from that. And that's one thing we can do with this small project that it's cumulative. The director of the most important conservation institution in Guinea-Bissau, which has passed a few years ago, two years ago, was a product of cumulative small contributions that ended up by creating all the possibilities that he then benefited. And so I think that um, this momentum that uh, Mariana was talking about can also be created by small contributions from several projects, several researchers in several periods of time. Thank you. Uh, Raquel? If not, it's OK. Uh, I just want to thank you all. Reading this question is very important. I'm sad that the conclusion in YouTube is not being translated in Portuguese, because this is really a main issue. Um, I'm also against it. I think even if you go for a few days in a country, you always can find the time. This is a philosophical uh, way of positioning yourself in science instead of just you don't find the time. It just there's always time for going to uh, a university and present your work. And like Mohammed was saying, talk with the students, invite them to come to the field with us. And also, uh, but it is also important to to highlight that you are, you have the reason to say that this system is not um, supporting this kind of practice as well. So short term projects and uh, also uh, pressuring for high, high impact. I mean, the way was saying that yes, very small yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but is, yeah. exactly they, the way the system work is not helping to go in this to, in this direction, I agree with you in uh, a lot of things, especially for instance, the big grants are always from the global north. So you're not finding the interests that are in the local areas where you're working. Because if you wanna go from the scratch, you should go and find what the, the, the governments, the, the, the local associations are interested in and that are funding and Usually they are not so um, huge amounts of money or uh, not so fundamental questions that can, can appear and be published in nature. So that's already, um, how can I say, <laughs> it's not favoring the, the direction to go into the direction, but it's possible. And I'm, I'm glad that we are talking about this today. And it's no, I think it's just a coincidence, but I must say that today is the the day of the national heroes of Mozambique, and also the day we remember the uh, Batapa massacre in Saint Tome. So uh, we could just <laughs> thank the universe for this coincidence. And... Uh, hello, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to be debating uh, all of these very important subjects. 
Um, I was hearing um, you all talking and I, I remember it could be interesting to develop uh, like a kind of a questionnaire, a self, um, self um, awareness questionnaire uh, in which uh, each researcher doing uh, their field work somewhere um, could to try to understand if they are, if they, they if their projects or their conduct is has signs of helicopter research so um we could we could create this because uh, in in choppy b and in cb we have enough critical mass to to develop this type of questions and maybe we could start um improving uh, some important details right because i think we are all uh diversion divergence a little bit uh we all i, I think by the by the fact that we are all here it means that we um are concerned about um good practices uh in our research right so i don't think the um, it's kind of superficial to be uh, defending that we should change uh, our ideas and our mentality in doing research in the tropics because we as we are here it, it it's proof that we are already concerned so we 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 are past that first level of oh my god maybe i'm doing um more bad than good right as a researcher so um in in a way to move forward um um, responding to, to the to your plea in the, your presentation, I think it could be interesting to to develop this, and I would ask uh, TropiBU uh, core researchers to um, to put us all into contact. Right. So, and Mohammed, uh, I have been working in Guinea Bissau for some time now, uh, and I really uh, I, I really enjoy uh, your country. Such an amazing place to be, um, but. Uh, I, and I understand where that um, suggestion of taking a, a student to the field comes from. Okay, so I try, I try my very best to do that. But there is also, I think, a disconnection between um, researchers coming to the country and what students in Guinea-Bissau uh, are expecting from those uh, researchers, because obviously they see us as very important people, uh, possibly with a lot of resources. Um, and uh, I have been uh, observing um, more and more demanding on per diems, um, even if I want to teach them, right? So, so you know, it's not um, it's not straightforward. And I think the best would have would be to have like a focal, like a an institution in which we could communicate with and could define this for the students. Okay, not not with the students, um, like going to Guinea Bissau and finding a student and taking the student to the field. It should not be like this. It should be uh, through an institution. Okay, so the institution can explain to the to the student um, exactly what should be their expectations, what is the importance of being working with a particular researcher, uh, so they can they can understand the value of what they are gaining uh, through that training. Okay. Um, I, I, I really enjoy uh, being there, so it's not. Uh, don't take this as a, a criticism or anything. I, it, it happens in other countries. It's just that I have more experience in Guinea-Bissau, and this is why I'm uh, taking the advantage to to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just a bit afraid of the time, and I'm sorry. Ah, yeah, we we can uh, meet afterwards. So I will end the session. Thank you very much, Mohamed, and to everyone who, who has been online this time. Thank you all. Uh, and thank you very much to, to each of you and to this, the panelists as well.